So thanks uh, for joining me today. Uh, this is the first time I've uh, actually put my thoughts together uh, about working with government. Um, uh, as Michelle uh, said to you, uh, my name is Doug Steiner. I'm a uh, Canadian. I was born in Montreal, so I've got a bit of French and English uh, Canada in me. Uh, and I've been working in Toronto for uh, quite a long time, since the mid 80s. And I've been really focused on um, innovation and entrepreneurship primarily focused in the finance area and and I want to tell you a little bit about my background uh, you know and then uh, this presentation will be done in three uh, phases one is just a bit of a setup uh, for what I'm going to talk about I'm going to and then I'm going to get into a little bit of behavior analysis between government and industry which I've learned over the time period that I've been working both in industry and government and then finally just some uh, tips and hacks in terms of both government people who are interested in trying to uh, uh, forward an innovation agenda, and also the trickier part, which is businesses that actually want to sell into government and, and how uh, some of the things that you should do should uh, should uh, you try and fall not fall into rabbit holes when you're trying to do that. So I'm just going to go ahead and do this. So my background uh, is kind of unusual. I'm kind of a Swiss army knife of uh, entrepreneur and consultant. I started uh, my career in the, as a financial advisor, actually, and then ended up very quickly uh, um, on the mathematics side in the financial industry. And then I did a lot of uh, inventing, I'd say leading uh, at, at the leading edge of finance, uh, going back into the late 80s and 90s, um, and ended up running, uh, doing a startup, uh, taking a company public, selling it. And uh, for the last 10 years, I've been advising uh, both uh, government and uh, industry around technology implementation. I think one of the really interesting things is uh, a lot of businesses don't know how to use modern technology. And I think for some of the fellows that are looking at uh, being entrepreneurs and starting, uh, this is a really important thing that there's going to be a lot of ideas that uh, are brought up in the, in the cases of some of these uh, lectures. And one of the things I want to focus people on is there's a lot of current businesses that need modernizing, not just startups uh, trying to do something new. And then uh, I, I want to make sure that uh, this isn't too uh, preachy a lecture. I want to get some feedback from people in, in this process because I've been uh, quite successful in a lot of ventures and I've also failed in a lot as well. Fortunately, I've had more successes than failures. So I'll just go ahead and... Uh... So uh, I, th I think the primary benefits of the lecture uh, today are just to talk about uh, why I think it's important for government to innovate uh, and then... Uh, just to give you some examples of uh, what I've been doing uh, in Canada with uh, government and, and trying the innovation agenda. And I think one of the things that's uh, really important that when you're trying to innovate in government, there's got to be a good reason for it. And uh, obviously, uh, cost and uh, uh, public policy are really important in that. And then uh, government always, uh, uh, as I'm going to talk a little later, always uh, steps on policy first uh, before they start innovating anything. They just don't decide like an entrepreneur does to come up with a new idea and start stuff. And then uh, for industry, uh, for startup and uh, corporations, uh, wh what are the uh, business anchors that you need to actually have in government to actually get some engagement? And then uh, for people, especially with smaller companies, um, um, I've had some successes with very small companies uh, uh, advising and, and selling into government, uh, but I've done that with partners. I wanna talk about that a little bit later. And I think through this lecture, if, if anybody wants to ask a question, uh, please put it in the chat function or put your hand up. I, I, you know, Michelle's uh, making uh, me honest and we'll, we'll stop this and, uh, and can stop me and then we can answer some questions as we go along. So I'd like this to be as interactive as possible. So I, I think probably the most important thing is the behavior of government and the behavior of business is different. And I, I just want to highlight that my background's in behavioral science as well as a, a lot of financial technology. And then... Uh, one thing that you should always remember if you're in government, uh, you'll know this already, is uh, the big things are you have to basically have a policy agenda and implement policy. And then when you're doing that, there, uh, there's a risk framework that you're always working with. There's risk budgeting and then there's uh, uh, perceived and real risk that you're uh, taking in that. Government uh, does not like taking a lot of risk. And I think I'm going to talk about that a lot uh, more. Uh, I also want to talk about the different levels of government, uh, because at the top, uh, New Zealand and Canada are the same. You have elected officials. Uh, they have an ob objective function of being liked and being reelected. I think that's very different from running government. And I think those two conflicts uh, have conflicts sometimes. And then uh, you have to basically understand government is a process-driven organization. 
entrepreneurs are more event driven organization and you have to basically understand that process in all government organizations drive the strategy uh, going forward. So I want to uh, basically start by, by a fun uh, sort of way is uh, I got an Oliver Wyman uh, slide here. And then uh, I, I, you know, when Oliver Wyman and, and McKinsey, and all these people are pitching in government, they actually have all these matrix uh, diagrams and the, their public private partnerships obviously have a very kind of a, a focused thing on objectives, uh, trying to figure out if you can actually do what you're going to do. And I'm going to talk about legislation and policy in uh, uh, part of this lecture. And then how do you monitor and how, how do you have metrics in that? And then, uh, you know, for government, obviously, they have to communicate what they're trying to do. And these are really, really important uh, factors. But when you look at this from a uh, entrepreneur's lens, it looks a little bit different. So I basically took the Oliver Wyman thing and made one for an entrepreneur, which basically said, uh, it, I have a product or a service and can I sell it into the government? Uh, uh, more importantly, when, and the success of some very large uh, businesses uh, who've been bumping up regulators, I think of uh, people like Uber, DoorDash, some of these uh, large US companies that have basically just decided that regulation is not important, is uh, what are the rules uh, of engagement, the legislative rules, and what happens if I break them? And in some cases, uh, for example, in finance, if you start moving money around, you end up in jail because uh, you're going to get charged with uh, some nefarious thing, non-regulated and money laundering. Uh, in the case of uh, Uber with taxis, uh, it wasn't so bad. And they basically ended up working with uh, legislative and government to get their stuff done. Uh, the other important thing is uh, when you're talking to people in government or when government people are talking uh, to uh, innovators uh, outside is uh, th this whole concept of, of understanding of, of what the, the triggers and uh, constraints are for each per people. In government, it's obviously budgeting, procurement. There's going to be a lot of things that uh, you can't uh, change. There's also a lot of things you can change because once the inertia gets going in government, obviously you can do a lot. And the same thing for an entrepreneur. What, what happens when you go into government? You start talking to people and they don't even understand what you're doing. I'll give you a good example I'm dealing with now. I'm working for uh, uh, policy around securities regulation. And a lot of the people I'm working with are very smart lawyers, securities lawyers. But when I start talking about decentralized finance, uh, or cryptocurrency, a lot of them have a basic understanding of what a Bitcoin is, but they actually don't understand the technology behind it. So there's always issues in translation. And then I think the final thing is who wants to listen to me? And I think for government uh, who you're trying to innovate, uh, uh, where do you go in other departments up or down for people to listen to you? And the same thing, if you're trying to sell, is there somebody that wants, if you're pitching, does somebody want to catch uh, what, you're, what you're trying to do? So I want to talk a little bit about behavior mismatch and uh, what governments think and how they how they work and they they have a decision function that doesn't change and that that it can be a barrier to innovative uh, decision making and also innovation. The first one I, I call is popularity. Uh, when you go into a government and you get up to the assistant deputy minister and uh, some department that you might be wanting to sell to or that you're working in government at a, a policy level or, or working at a functional level, yeah, you always end up with, if you want to do something big, you end up with the elected officials uh, in government. Uh, and popularity is the most important thing for an elected official. Um, I've been many times to see if, uh, for example, the finance department, our federal finance department in Canada be interested in a new technique for, for exact tracking consumer spending, and the first question I always get asked if you actually talk to the policy people is, will my boss get reelected if he implements this uh, new technology? And in a lot of cases, the answer is no. It, uh, it's a great thing. I'm a good entrepreneur. I find a new good business or service, and I think the government should really use it. But they got, they've got to need it, and the, need, the first need is popularity. So, for example, in the finance area in Canada, the, the only need that I could find where people were actually interested in was payment remittances where we have a lot of immigrant population that send money to the, the old country. Uh, and they thought that if they could change policy for uh, payment remittances, that they could get more votes. Anything else, they basically said, you know, we have a fire somewhere in this organization, but right now we just see smoke, so we don't really care about it. The other thing is it's hard to implement things in uh, government. And there's what I call implementation friction. Everybody's got a job to do. Governments run like a factory. They don't actually run like an innovative uh, 
place. They've got a uh, policy in place. They have uh, uh, programs that they're trying to implement. And if you say, well, I can implement this program quicker or slower or more efficiently with technology, there's still friction uh, uh, in, in that process for trying to change anything. The, the other thing is um, government doesn't actually have a lot of metrics. Uh, for some government agencies, they do. But for many government agencies, they're not used to the new metric analysis. They're not very uh, conversant with outreach technology for finding out if people like things or don't like things. They do rely on consultants to do that a lot. And I think that's an opportunity. Um, the other thing in government I found is that uh, because of the way government's set up to buy things, it's much easier for government to throw people at uh, problems rather than technology. So uh, in a lot of the uh, cases where I've tried an innovation agenda, they'll say, well, how many people do you need? And I say, I don't need any people. I'd like to buy some technology or have new telecommunications or infrastructure for uh, trying to find out how we can do things better in government. And they say, well, if you want technology, we can. In the case of uh, uh, one example I had recently, uh, I wanted to buy some Apple products and the government uh, that I'm working for only buys, uh, or they said we're not an Apple shop. I actually was able to do it, but it took over six months to buy some Apple products uh, uh, for me to work with, uh, for, uh, for example, for design people who actually wanted to use them. I think one of the other things is inertia. Uh, government has its own uh, tempo. And uh, for anybody that's selling into government or government that's trying to deal with innovative uh, entrepreneurs, there's an inertia difference. Uh, entrepreneurs want to move quick. Uh, they want to break things. They want to fail. And breaking things and failing is not a big government thing. They don't like doing that because uh, they're supposed to be uh, implementing agendas uh, and programs based on policy. And if they don't implement it properly, then they, they have a problem with newspapers telling uh, people that uh, in the public that they can't get the stuff done. And then uh, the final thing I'm going to talk about is uh, the ability and timing to legislate uh, change. Uh, some of the issues uh, around the timing it's going to take, and I'm going to go into that a little more, more in, in a couple of slides here. So I said uh, popularity is really important just to drive it home. Uh, any change that you uh, end up in any ministry that you're trying to sell to, any change when you're in the government, uh, is uh, will it affect the ability for the people that are leading and the, the elected officials to get reelected? And I think this is part of the decision framework that you have to work out. And then, uh, as I said, many major innovative concepts fail to impress and let, unless the electorate's on board, right? And I, I'm going to get into that at the end, which is if you want to try and do stuff, stuff differently, you're going to have to take your own time uh, in the government by writing uh, papers or doing research uh, briefs. And in as an entrepreneur trying to get into the press and on social media to start stating your case about why you think what you're doing would be beneficial for government. So I talked a little bit about implement, uh, implementation friction. I want to dig into that a little bit more. Uh, I work uh, for the government currently in, in, uh, in for one of the provinces in Canada. And that uh, we have, I'm sure uh, the, the federal and uh, municipal levels in government have procurement policies. They're put in place for a very good reason. There, there was a lot of graft and corruption in Canada with uh, procurement favoritism. So we have very strict policies. For example, to do technology, uh, you can't spend more than $25,000 uh, twice. So two $25,000 contracts, which for anybody that's in, uh, in business knows it's not a lot of money. After that, uh, we have to go to a request for proposal. Uh, we have to have three comp uh, competing bids. They have to be assessed and then the bids uh, given based on a very strict criteria. So the most important thing that new businesses should know in any of pro any procurement policies, they're at a complete competitive disadvantage because a lot of uh, procurement uh, frameworks for the constraints have how long have these people been in business, who else have they sold to, and if you're a new startup, it's very, very hard. I'm going to talk a little bit about that at the end. And then uh, You'll find that when you're selling the government, there's a lot of government agencies that don't actually have current business expertise. A lot of people have worked in government a long time uh, and they lack what I call modern internal business uh, expertise. For example, um, one of the issues that I've been dealing with is um, open source software use for technology and government. It's very hard to do because there's no sales process in any procurement process that I just talked about. 
for example, in the RFI or an RFP process, there has to be a response. Uh, obviously, open source doesn't have a sales force. It's open source software. So you have to actually have a consultant help you uh, if you're going to use open source software with some of your uh, processes or if you're in government and you want to try open source software, uh, you have to fight against uh, waterfall uh, development processes where you have to define everything up front versus agile development processes where you're doing stuff on the fly. Uh, I think one of the other things that I found is uh, government uh, is very, uh, and I'm being uh, a bit polite here, likes what I call synchronous information. And in the normal parlance, that means everybody gets in a room and we talk about it. And I think in technology and, uh, and most small businesses and many large businesses now, they're very adept at asynchronous uh, information transfer uh, using, uh, just like EHF does using Slack, We've got people all over the world who are fellows and we can't all have meet at the same time. But I think one of the things is, for example, where I'm working Slack, we're not allowed to use Slack. We have Microsoft uh, Teams and the chat function, but that the information is only saved for a couple of weeks because we have freedom of information requests. For example, people don't want to, if you're having a discussion or a, an argument with somebody, they don't want to come in the public. So we do use chat functions. Uh, but I think over a period of time that you'll find out that uh, if you can work with uh, government in uh, an asynchronous manner, it's a lot better because then you're not waiting around for people to have meetings. And then uh, finally, and just in the implementation friction, uh, there's not a lot of use of social media in government. Uh, they're a little bit scared. Uh, I've been a big proponent of using Instagram, Facebook, and uh, some of the other social media programs. And now we're getting into podcasts, for example, but these are all new things. Uh, government likes uh, pushing information out. They're not been very good uh, at um, uh, two-way communications, getting feedback, but I think that's going to change. And that's also an, uh, an opportunity for entrepreneurs and also an opportunity for people in government to get more feedback for what they're doing. I want to stop there, uh, Michelle. Just I want to uh, make sure I'm not going too fast if there's any questions or, or should I just keep going? Does anyone have any questions at this point? No, all good. Okay, I think you can keep going there, Doug. I don't okay. think you're going too fast. Uh, in the people technology trade-off, I, I think this is something that's really interesting, uh, something that I didn't really expect when I got into government. Uh, it's much easier hiring a, a person than buying technology. And I think this is something that uh, uh, I want to drive home in this uh, lecture is that the government actually has a lot of technology, but they're run through long-term contracts. So, uh, for example, uh, I don't know how far the New Zealand government is into using um, outsourced uh, uh, business processes or cloud computing, but there's thousands of long-term contracts that the government uses to run its operations. And those contracts have development resources and they also have um, uh, service resources uh, applied to them over a long period of time. People have made decisions. Uh, they say, we're using this program or the software we want to keep using it, even though you might be in government, say there's a way better way of doing it. You have to get uh, a, a long, uh, a far along a road where you have to actually uh, basically sell on a risk reduction type of uh, process for uh, for you to, uh, to take out a long-term contract and replace it. Also, there's a lot of, uh, and this happens in all business, uh, when you put in new technology, there's processing compatibility. For example, a lot of new uh, workflow software, especially in ERP, uh, business processing uh, actually changes uh, processes internally. These are something that are very beneficial for government, but very hard to explain when there's a department full of lots of people and you say, you know, we actually don't need to do this work. Uh, it can be done by a for-profit uh, company. But I think, again, this is one of, uh, one of the areas uh, where there's a lot of opportunity uh, of selling into government. Um, government, have a pro government also has a problem attracting that the, the brightest and best. Uh, there's no stock options in the government. Uh, you can't give people incentives. Uh, uh, on the other side of the coin, uh, for a lot of people, the behavior around government, which is a, a slow process, uh, uh, a building where you, uh, you know, you, you achieve things over a long period of time, uh, does appeal to a lot of people. A lot of people aren't super motivated by high salary, for example, on the technology side. They'd rather work um, uh, for the public good. So. There are a lot of trade-offs uh, that we have to deal with uh, one, uh, right now when I'm working in government where we just can't hire, for example, data scientists. And uh, one of the workarounds we've done is we've been hiring uh, co-op and engineering students 
students rather than data scientists to give them some uh, some experience. But the other side of the coin is we're getting the most modern uh, and the best educated people out of the universities right after we finish. And then just generally, I've talked about this uh, uh, previously, is that there's a lack of understanding of new business processes uh, in resource planning, business process outsourcing, the difference uh, between how you develop technology where uh, the old style would be, just tell me exactly where you're going to build, give me the entire uh, library of everything you need to do versus saying we've got a problem and using uh, open source components and then agile development processes, things like using JIRA for uh, doing uh, tracking how things are going, teaching senior people in government how uh, these new technologies and new uh, uh, applications and tools are used. And then for really important stuff, uh, I'm dealing with this right now, actually how you're storing data. Uh, I'm, I've introduced graph databases uh, to the government where we're, they're relation uh, based uh, for, for those of you who are more technologically uh, savvy, uh, uh, people like Facebook and Twitter uh, keep all their data in relational uh, graph databases, which are much faster and have much better uh, uh, matching correlating uh, uh, abilities than no normal relation databases. And then the final thing is uh, you have to engage with people the way people want to be engaged with. Uh, it's, no, not, uh, it's not a very good idea to try and get something published in an uh, academic journal or in a newspaper when everybody's getting their information through news feeds, uh, through their social media. And I think just teaching and, and helping government understand and also going into government understanding the engagement strategies uh, outreach strategies, um, um, being able to uh, uh, basically do con uh, consumer journeys are very, very important and uh, might be foreign in government as well. Uh, I talked about this a little bit. Uh, governments don't like failing. Uh, that being said, uh, I think one of the things that I want to hammer home in this lecture is if you want to sell the government, it's never upside, it's risk reduction. And I can't state that enough which is if you want to basically sell something in government or if you want to get something done in government, you have to attach, attach risk parameters for not making the decision that you want it made. And I can think of a lot of examples for this where uh, people actually have sold very large uh, processes and programs in the government. Uh, COVID would be an excellent example of the speed at which government uh, changed uh, technology and policies was almost on a weekly basis, but it was all based on risk reduction. None of it was based on, there was no upside in COVID except uh, getting back to normal. But I think one of the things that I learned uh, from working in the government is they can move incredibly quickly if there's a crisis that they have to solve. And then the other thing is that yeah, we're also working in an organization where if things are okay, people aren't that motivated to change them. And I think you've got to change the okay if you're working in government to this isn't okay because there's a way better way of doing this. And if you're selling into government, uh, I, I've got a better way of doing it. And your okay way is not that good. Um, one of the biggest problems I dealt with, because uh, I ran a bunch of businesses that tried to sell in government, into government unsuccessfully, is what I, I call a behavioral heuristic, uh, which is quite normal, called status quo bias, which is everything's okay. We don't want to change anything. And I can think of a status quo bias helpers in... Uh, in government, the way government runs. For example, uh, I'm really interested in open banking in Canada. It's not gonna happen because we have five large banks. They make a lot of money by having not open banking. Uh, and they're basically changing the narrative in Canada to say, well, banking's open, you can go into any bank branch. And I, I said, you know, open banking from a technology standpoint isn't digitization as far as the government knows because the, the government wanted to talk to them have said, uh, I understand banking's open, their branches are open 24 hours a day. And I'm like, that's not open banking. They've changed the narrative. And I think that's something that I've, uh, I've done it. The other ones are in climate change where uh, the, the perception on um, status quo, which is it's not affecting me or the weather's not that good. It's a little bit colder today, uh, long-term plans. And then when you get into established business supported networks that are keeping government programs running, there's a lot of uh, inertia to make sure that the status quo. And then every time uh, we try and change things in government, uh, inside of government or outs from outside of government, there's always this question like, why, why should I do this with you? And I think you have to have a really good answer for that as well. 
here's probably the most interesting thing that I learned uh, from working in government, which is uh, uh, I tried to get the government in Canada to use uh, debit cards uh, for tracking people with unemployment insurance. I said we could yeah, get, instead of issuing a check or, or putting money to somebody's bank account, we could issue debit cards. And then we could pay people a little bit of extra money, tell them that we're going to uh, be creepy and follow their track and see where they're spending their money. And uh, they thought it was a fantastic idea until I finally got to the implementation uh, uh, program manager and he said, we can't do it. And I said, why? And he said, we're not allowed to issue money on debit cards. And I said, says who? And he said, says the law. We have a law that says the only two ways we can send money to people are through uh, by check in the mail or directly into the bank account. And if you want to put uh, a deposit from unemployment insurance or social ser service uh, uh, programs on a debit card, we actually have to have a legislative change. So what's in involved in that? First of all, you've got an elected government that has a certain amount of legislated, uh, legislation they want to table. And most uh, governments uh, understand in New Zealand, it's a three-year window in Canada, it's a four-year window. So they've got a certain amount of legislation they want to put through. You've got to slide your legislation in, but before you basically figure out where you're going to slide it in, you've got to write it, which means you've got to basically have somebody in the Justice Department or the legal, if you do a private member's bill, a local bill, uh, or a government bill, which are, is the same in Canada as New Zealand, you have to have somebody sponsor that bill and actually write it. You have to draft it. You have to send it to Parliament. They've got to read for it. They've got to comment. So the that's the biggest uh, barrier you're going to get to major change in uh, in government is you basically a lot of things that are very innovative you have to actually have a change and i'm going to talk a little bit about how we did a workaround on that in, in the canadian market and then you also have to remember that the government is is like a business it has an operational cycle they have operating frameworks they have annual budgets uh they actually have to push something into there and if you want to get them to buy something or if you're in government you want to get them to spend something on money you've got to push it into a budget, an operational cycle, you've got to put it in a business plan. That takes time. And I guess uh, for a lot of startups, they don't even understand the months and months it takes to get stuff done. So I want to talk a little bit about my experience. And I have some examples here of uh, basically getting stuff done. And I think one of the things uh, I've been doing, and I'll mention a couple of businesses I've started and run, and how we actually dug ourselves into the government quite effectively. Um, I ended up uh, in a business uh, a long time ago in the, in the late 90s and uh, early 2000s where I was doing online trading and the banks didn't like it. So what they did was uh, something very clever. They just cut me out of the payment system in Canada, which is obviously illegal. And I ended up uh, going to the government's uh, equivalent of the antitrust or competition bureau, it's called in Canada, to complain about doing this. So when I was up there, I said, is there any way I can prevent this from happening again? They said, you have to start basically getting into the public's mind what you want to do with them. They will agree with you. I had a big business, but there was, uh, there was forces, this status quo bias and forces that wouldn't let me do it. So I decided I wanted to write. And, and I said, I'd started very simply. I started writing letters to the editor for a national newspaper and end up being a columnist. Uh, and the minute I started uh, with the pen in my hand and being a columnist in the newspaper, nobody ever took a shot at me again. And I, the most powerful lesson I think I learned was if you can drive narration of your issues and solutions in the public market any way you can. And uh, 20 years ago, the only way you could do that was to be a, uh, you know, a journalist in a newspaper or actually have somebody do a story about what you're doing. And I found uh, what was very uh, important and what's super important now is there's many, many ways to get your story out. And there's many ways to narrate issues. And I can't you know, uh, uh, emphasize enough the issues uh, and the opportunities that social media um, uh, can present to people if they want to get uh, their story told, starting a new business. Even in government, uh, we're uh, starting a program where we're writing uh, position papers and thought pieces on, on changes that we want to make in an innovation agenda and getting some uh, feedback. And for me, uh, I ended up, uh, I've got a uh, example here of uh, writing for a deal book, which is part of the New York Times, where we were running a consulting business around behavioral science and decision making. And uh, I ended up uh, in a business relationship with Bernie Madoff. Fortunately, it didn't hurt me too much. But I talked about how people uh, don't uh, say uh, what they really mean in a lot of cases. 
And th that ended up, uh, obviously, when you write for the New York Times, and uh, I actually just proposed writing this article about what people think uh, honest people should look like and what they're actually like and how con artists uh, believe. Another one uh, I've got in the middle here, which is uh, one of my business partners, Nina Majar, who is an uh, academic at uh, B Works. We did a lot of uh, work using uh, uh, behavioral science techniques to get people to, to, to stop not paying their credit card. In other words, trying to basically uh, uh, stop people from uh, having credit card delinquency. The only way we ended up with a lot of businesses by writing a research report, which ended up in the Harvard Business Review, of our success in, in uh, getting people to make better decisions about paying uh, credit. And then the final one, which is a very large uh, technology undertaking that I was a part of at the payments uh, regulator in Canada, where we uh, convinced the government to uh, let the regulator actually borrow money to build modern technology and ended up spending just under $300 million modernizing the payment system. So I, I said the engagement uh, test uh, for people trying to get stuff done in government is get your word out. If you want to try something different, make sure there's a place that you can do it. Uh, try and convince your boss that you want to write a paper with a co-write a paper with somebody uh, in business that uh, talks about some of the issues that you're dealing with. And everybody likes the newspaper test. I know all politicians and government people read the newspaper, but the newspaper test is the old test. It's now what I call the engagement test, which is how many views can you get on YouTube? How many engagement, uh, how many engagement metrics can you get through social media with Instagram, Facebook, TikTok, Twitch, any of the places uh, that are important, especially when you're trying to reach younger, younger people with uh, discussion about these issues. I think the second uh, thing that I've learned is uh, it's way easier selling into government and it's way easier being in government and trying to change stuff if you can point to people that have already done it. And I give, I'll give you three examples here. Uh, the middle one is the OSC Innovation Office, which uh, I was uh, a co-designer and, uh, and uh, manager of uh, until uh, recently at the Ontario Securities Commission, which is our, uh, our effectively our national regulator uh, in Canada, where we started. I'll, I'll explain a little bit more how we got that going. But we took our, our cue from two other places, uh, the financial, uh, uh, the FCA, which is the financial regulator in the UK, basically had an innovation hub. We just called them up and said, hey, how did you get it going? Can you give us your pitch deck that you gave to senior management? Uh, what worked and didn't work? Because I think a lot of stuff they did, they had now have 300 people in their innovation hub. Uh, we have 15 in Ontario. And then uh, we ended up uh, uh, connecting with the, uh, the, the Global Innovation Hub for Business in Singapore, which I think would be the, probably the, the shiny example of the government basically saying, tell us how we can make this city better in this country. You know, it's a city country how we can do it, give us all the ways to do it, and then actually putting capital and uh, people behind uh, th those processes. And then uh, in the case of the FCA and Singapore and the OSC is somebody in government didn't actually have to write a rule that just said, we want a new policy. In the case of uh, the Ontario Securities Commission, where I'm uh, just finishing up a consulting agreement, uh, a project with them, they basically said, we want to promote economic growth, and we want to foster innovation, tell us how to do it. So th that was dropped in my lap and my partner's lap, uh, Pat Chokos, who works with me as a director at the Ontario Securities Commission. And we designed a very small office and we put only two things in it. We basically put an engagement group in it and then a group of lawyers and accountants that basically went and asked the government if we could get a, a limited time license to try new things. So we have a very complicated uh, securities framework, just like that you have in New Zealand. We said, if somebody wants to come in and try and uh, trade something we've never seen before, or they want to try digital currency, or they want to try lending money against digital assets, can we get uh, a legal framework that we can give them relief for a certain period of time? And in almost any jurisdiction, will give you a little bit of license to try some stuff if you get that permission from it. And that's been very successful. The innovation office now has 15 people in it and we're doing our first big uh, testing environment, which we built a test lab uh, process for it um, and a sandbox to test uh, certain types of technology that people are using in other countries to see if it works in Canada. And then the, the other thing is you've got to operationalize new ideas. This is great to you know, run around and uh, pitch new ideas into government or in government pitching new ideas to your boss. 
uh, is you have to operationalize it. And the easiest way I found to do it is to basically have uh, a temporal community uh, event, I'll call it that. And I said the easiest way to do it, because I'm focused on uh, technology is to have a hackathon, which is come up with a problem, have a very small prize. I, I, I made the Elon Musk uh, $100 million prize for carbon removal as the world's biggest one. But uh, uh, we did a hackathon uh, in the government and the prize was, uh, uh, it was barely dinner for two, but it was uh, it was for a, a notoriety. Uh, we ended up with 25 uh, firms working on three problems. We ended up with a couple of incredibly smart, uh, very small pilot uh, and uh, show me's from technology that people designed in a very short period of time. So you can get a lot of work at, done by participating in hackathons, but as government, you can get a lot of uh, problems solved very quickly very innovatively, and I've seen them uh, very smart ones done in in climate uh, sequ sequ sequitrace, sequ sequitrace in, uh, in climate um, uh, uh, credit uh, uh, auditing. Uh, I was involved in a hackathon uh, for that, and people came up with the unbelievably smart uh, solutions for that in a very short period of time. So I said, you know, if you give a prize, and the prize doesn't have to be big uh, for an actual answer to anything you're trying to do in government. Uh, they're the best incentive for people to come and work with you. And then I, I want to uh, leave you with uh, probably the best example of uh, innovation in government. Uh, and it's something uh, that I've been watching very closely is uh, Estonia, uh, for those of you who don't know, was a uh, satellite uh, country of the Soviet empire that got released uh, in the late 90s. Uh, and they decided that they had a once in a lifetime chance to uh, to just build infrastructure from scratch. And I don't know if anybody's actually looked at them. Uh, they basically uh, ended up with two very young people running the government. One was 31, the other was 34. Uh, and they basically did two things. They said, okay, we can use new technology and we don't know what the hell we're doing. So we're just gonna hire a lot of consultants. So they basically got insiders to say, okay, if you were designing government from scratch, how would you do that? So what they did was they said, okay, you guys need to give everybody access. So try and build up your in infrastructure for uh, interaction and telecommunications. And for those of you who don't know, Skype was one of the outputs of, uh, of that uh, as an Estonian company, was uh, partially one of the reasons it got uh, quick, uh, going so quickly, was that it was available to all the citizens in Estonia just after they started. They basically talked about uh, what were the two things that really, really needed to be focused on First one was uh, make sure educational resources were available and that the ability to learn was available online. So you're capturing a cohort of citizens between the ages of 16 and 20, but obviously government programs take seven or eight years to finish. And then what happens is you end up with uh, acolytes that, that are basically hooked on the methods that uh, you're using, both for citizen interaction and for education. Uh, and then uh, they worked really hard on making sure it was simple to pay your taxes, for example. Um, and then uh, they established what I call, uh, they called an innovation policy platform. They basically said, we have a policy of trying new things. Here are all the problems that we're trying to solve. Here's some capital, come and build some businesses and we'll be your first customer. And I think that was really good. So uh, e Estonia uh, has come up with this uh, thing that I don't know if, uh, People in New Zealand are very familiar with it, but they, uh, uh, you can actually become a resident, an electronic resident of Estonia. Uh, what you need is, uh, it's a 30 minute application. You need your own CV. So who you are or the, who you are and your uh, partners are. You need a business plan. Uh, you have to have a passport and then you have a new passport photo and a credit card. And basically it allows you, if you wanna start a business in Estonia, even if you don't, never ever entered the country, you can form a company there. You can basically get internet access and, and have a, a secure internet location. So for example, if you wanna sell online goods and services uh, in Estonia, but Estonia is a member of the EU. So it basically gives you access to the EU for doing that. And they have a very simple uh, methodology for doing that. And I would encourage people, especially uh, people in New Zealand that are entrepreneurs that wanna think about entering the EU with actually, uh, actually being there, to, to look at uh, Estonia's e-resident uh, process. But I, I, I use that as an example of 
really excellent innovation in government and really good partnership with uh, with outside uh, consultants, also with outside businesses to get that done. So I'm just going to finish up here, uh, uh, just talking about uh, the fellowship and, and, and its potentials to drive innovation with the fellows. And uh, what I'm talking about is, I think one of the most important thing is doing what I'm doing, which is start telling people how to get stuff done. Uh, if people are interested in uh, working papers around what innovation looks like in government, I'm, I'm happy and would be happy to uh, do activity promotion and co-author papers for you. I've done a couple. Um, I think uh, this is for Michelle and her team at EHF is uh, highlighting the features of our fellows and what they're capable of doing in government is really important. Uh, and I think as we start to engage more, e the uh, EHF fellows and the Edmund Hillary Institute engages more with government, which they're already doing, obviously, especially on the immigration side, that we, we can tell the, the story of what we're doing uh, out, outside of the, the organization in many places and promote what we're doing because as, as long as government obviously is happy with what we're doing, they're gonna be very thrilled to work with us. So I think uh, obviously people have opinion, uh, they, can, they can foster that opinion through uh, social media and outreach engagement. There's lots of speaking and educational opportunities that I think we should be following up with. Obviously uh, uh, part of uh, the bunch of fellows, I'm an investor fellow, I'm also an entrepreneur, but advisory and capital application if uh, I'm going to put my hand up and saying I'm willing to work with a, a, a Kiwi firm, uh, another AHF fellow uh, wants to talk to me about trying to figure out this, and if they want capital applied to it, I'm you know I'm an investor. I'm I'm going to look at uh, uh, and I have other people that will look at these uh, types of uh, um, opportunities. Uh, case studies are really important uh, if we can show. Uh, the kinds of things we want to do are happening in other uh, countries like I'm doing right now with my experience in Canada and we can replicate it in, uh, in uh, New Zealand. I think that'd be really important. And then uh, we should actually send an invitation out uh, and I encourage people in government to reach out to us. And I think we should be reaching out to people to say, hey, is there some way we can partner uh, with government? I love uh, the fact that New Zealand only has two, really two levels of government, which is very different from almost every year other country you're dealing with a national or local government and if there's if there's uh, problems that we can solve by by doing public private partnerships uh i think it's something that we should be very good at being able to do so uh michelle that's it uh, i think that's uh, my lecture i'd be happy to answer any questions absolutely if you um uh share your stop sharing your screen you're on and mute. I can see you doug if you stop sharing your screen, and then everyone can see you as well. Does anyone have any questions for Doug? Any thoughts or any reflections or anything else you want him to dive into deeper? Sorry, I, I sorry, I can't hear you, Michelle. Am I? Can everybody else hear me? Yep. So everyone else can, Doug. So it must just be your internet connection again. That's it. Thanks. Okay. Yep. Perfect. Can you can hear, hear us you all? Okay. Great. I think it was why you were unsharing. Okay. Any thoughts, any questions? Anything that anyone wants anyone, Doug, to go in a little deeper on? Bronwyn? Yep. Uh, we're, we're from the Productivity Commission, me and Nigel, um, in New Zealand. And I don't know if you know, but the Productivity Commission are doing an inquiry at the moment into come up with ideas and um, recommendations about how the government can tackle um, persistent disadvantage. So it's from a social policy, I guess, perspective more than saying, well, there is an economic perspective as well, but in terms of you know, innovation within government, um, uh, you know, we're trying to think about and explore things about really devolving things and, you know, government getting out of the way, basically, and just allowing people to out there in communities who sort of know what the what the issues are and what needs to be done to be able to have the the latitude to be able to do that are there examples and, and look and alongside that i guess goes the budget and the funding and and, and so on yeah. and really devolving that is there anything in canada that you're aware of along those lines yeah I, I, can, I can find a couple but i think my experience has been uh uh trying to find a, a very small group of people that want to do an experiment and then framing it as an experiment and saying, if you're, if you're picking one community, for example, that you're trying to do this 
development of, of, of policies uh, mm -hmm. that you can say, hey, we want to try this for two years. Uh, here's the parameters. We only want to do it with a certain number of people. We want to learn from this thing. You can kill it. Uh, you can't kill it until the two years are up. But uh, what we want to do is report back to a year from now uh, and basically tell you how we're doing. And then we can have another discussion. So it's not like, uh, oh, my God, I have to change everything I'm doing. It's like, oh, we're just doing this little trial over here. Yeah. And we're uh, basically going to nurture this as best we can to see what is working or or A-B testing, which is what I've been doing with some of the, uh, the trials I've been doing with the government here around engaging with consumers, for example, around fraud. And what are, the, what are the best ways to engage it? Do you do it through consumer education? Do you do it by, uh, you know, uh, changing the payment processes that they make for making investments? And then instead of having one, we're saying we're going to try four or five, mm -hmm. and we're going to come back and we're going to tell you the best one that works. And I, I, I think that's the best way to do it because I know when you're working in government, if you say, hey, we want to just do this crazy thing, they're like, no. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, starting small and then building success and building from there, I think is. And then uh, trying to build a framework, which is what I did was I said, we want to do a multiple execution and experiment framework, not one experiment. So we wanted mm. to start a testing environment where we want to do multiple experiments in different things. And we can, we'll come up with the first one or you come up with the first one if you're talking to your bosses. But we have one we want to try as well, because I'm sure you have good ideas as well. And I think one of the things that the, an experimental, we, we have this thing called test lab, I can send you some information on it, where we actually built a business plan saying we want to test things, we don't know what we want to test because we don't know what people are worried about, uh, or we don't know what the big issues are going to be, but we want to have continuous cohorts of people that are coming in. So what we did was we, we, we actually talked to uh, the Australian Securities Commission, and they said, don't don't get people just to tell you, give you all their ideas because you'll be overwhelmed. What you do is listen to people and say, okay, we're going to have a cohort that's going to do this or a cohort that's going to do that. And then every nine months, we're going to start a new one. Mm -hmm. But please let us do three or four. Uh, don't shoot the baby with the bathwater because the first one failed because the other thing you have to tell people is some of your tests are not going to work. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. So I guess that, that would be good. So. I hope, did that answer your question? Yeah, yeah, did. yeah, and that's very much along with what we've been, you know, thinking as well, so thank you. Thank you. Thanks for one. Johnny, you've got your hand up there, and then I'll um, ask Kim's question. Yeah, kia ora, Doug. Hey, look, there's uh, lots of different ways I could go and lots of different questions I could ask, um, <laughs> but uh, I've, I've narrowed it down in my brain to two. So um, I uh, work at an organisation called Creative HQ, which is a sort of council-owned uh, not-for-profit, um, and we've been working in this area of public sector innovation for um, probably just about seven years. Um, most of our organization focused on startups, but, but the area I work yep. in is government. We've um, got one really big problem in New Zealand, in my opinion, when it comes to public sector innovation, and that is that no, no one owns it. You know, there's no central leader um, and a real lack of leadership from within government around who, who should who should promote who should foster who should be in charge of public sector innovation um and you know we, we run some programs that michelle's just shared the GovTech accelerator where we take a cohort of projects and um sort of run them through an experimentation framework you know like you mentioned in a safe repeatable way um but there's again a real lack of central ownership and then the other thing that we do is a public sector innovation measurement framework um, similar to the sort of Nordic innovation barometers that you may have heard of yeah. um, that we have developed New Zealand specific. But again, there's a real lack of central government funding for that. Um, and DIA have told us, hey, this is really exciting. We're really, really supportive, but we don't have any mechanism for Sunday funding system assets in the space of innovation. Um, yeah. And it's a real problem. We keep coming up with our Public Service Commission, don't want it, De Department of Internal Affairs, don't want it, Ministry of Business Innovation and Employment, don't want it. Um, so any any advice or, 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 or things around that would be hugely appreciated. Yeah, yeah so I, 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 my, my first comment is, uh, if you could pick a person, what, what would that person be doing? Would they be an elected official or... Would they be a leader in business or would they be a leader at the local level? So I wave a magic wand and say, okay, 
you can have anybody instantly turn into your biggest fan and biggest promoter. Who would that be? I think it would be a central government influencer, you know, maybe a um, politician. Uh, perhaps um, the Public Service Commission, who who ultimately instruct the public service in the direction okay. that they should be taking. Because yep. I believe innovation should be a core part of that, and there needs to be structure and system put in place to encourage yep. innovation. And you just simply okay. Doesn't. So, uh, can you finger a couple of people in that organization that would you'd like at, at a senior enough level that you'd mm. like to do that? Because I say what I would do, let's say you picked uh, Mary Brown. She's like the head of uh, public uh, sector. They're the policy people that are distributing what to do inside of the government. Uh, I'd write a opinion piece in the stuff or in the New Zealand Herald saying, addressing her or him and saying, uh, we need innovation leadership. Uh, well, this is all the things we'd like you to do. Please respond to my email or please respond to my opinion piece. So there are ways you can actually get invo involved in a in a, in a, in a uh, kind of two way conversation and narrative around if you're going to not do this, tell me what why what are the barriers for you not doing this? This is good. You can list obviously you've been doing this for seven years. You've been doing you have all these successes to say we need a great leadership. Uh, so that's one idea. The other one would be to actually approach people if you have connections with the person that you think should do it and and just sit down with them and say if you want to you know. Uh, help us and you want to make a name for yourself or if it's an elected official and nobody's taking this on saying you can be the minister of innovation if you actually uh, form this agenda what can we do to help you do this i think those are the two best things because you, you uh people that start leading that don't want to lead don't know they want to lead until you tell them you want them to lead so i think that would be my first advice to you was just go and say you're a leader why don't you lead in innovation this is you're going to get every young voter in the country behind you. So why wouldn't you do this? And I think you can make a very compelling argument for that, but it's gonna take your effort and the effort of the people you're working with to basically design what it looks like and then to go to that person and show them what uh, the, their, the benefits personally to them of them uh, being your basically leader are gonna be. Does that make sense? Mm, yeah. So find that person or those people. Mm. Now, don't, don't answer it now, but my other question would be around funding um, and, and the challenges there, but, but uh, I, I won't. I, th I think that they're connected, obviously, because then all of a sudden, if the government thinks it's a really good idea or some, a group of people think it's a good idea, funding just follows. So it's, it's, really hard. it's really hard pushing money into something nobody wants to do. Mm, nice. Johnny, I will actually connect you directly with Doug straight afterwards, because I think you two will actually continue to have a good conversation there. Good. And I think, Johnny, actually, the, what you're raising is very much the things we're coming across in our inquiry, you know, that systems level on who in government and how, who do we influence and who, where do we find our champions. And um, so we're very much asking the same questions. So I think we, we, we should connect. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I've put Doug's email address in the chat there, everyone, too. Yeah, I'll want. put my email in the chat if anyone wants Great, to thanks. contact us. And, and then thanks. just in the last three minutes, I'll just ask Kim's question, Doug. Um, so have you got any specific approach to New Zealand government you've identified from participation in EHF that was a surprise or unique to New Zealand that overseas fellows would benefit from knowing? So sorry, ask that question again. It's a complicated question. And then, right? Have you got your chat open? Have a read as well. It might be easier sometimes to read the question. Uh, any specific approach to the New Zealand government you have identified from the participant? uh no i'd say no nothing surprised me i i i what about no, to, to be, but even the size difference it doesn't like it was such a small country uh no I, I i you know i actually i don't really want to answer that question because i haven't really the the only my only experience with uh working with the government in new zealand was uh trying to figure out if uh you know, with immigration, if I wanted to work in New Zealand, uh, uh, when I mentioned uh, that I wanted to come and, and do some work down there, doing the same type of work I'm doing in Canada, they said, oh, you have to be an investor or an entrepreneur. And then they said, oh, there's this thing called the EHF. Uh, but it's, it's kind of out there. 
And I think that, that that was the old, my only experience with them. And then actually when I dug into it, it was Andre that was the first person I contacted. And I said, how out there are you? And then he went through what you guys are trying to do. I'm like, that's not out there at all. Right. So I think one of the things I found it that was a bit weird uh, when we, I was talking to the, these are Im local immigration people in the U S is they didn't have a really good appreciation of what the potential of the HF was when they were pitching it. Mm. Thanks, Doug. Just a quick one from Ben. Are the Estonia leaders popular after the big reform? Uh, I don't have enough uh, information on, <laughs> on uh, uh, what, what's happened there, but I can tell you, uh, I, I do have Estonian friends and they tell me how they operate with government and it's completely different. So I think New Zealand's uh, more advanced on tax. Estonia basically says uh, your tax return uh, has been filed on your behalf by the government. These are all the things that we know that you've done. These are all the investments you've made, and this is the income you've had, and this is your return, and this is how much you owe us. Please check to see if it's right. Versus what I do in Canada, which is I take a huge pile of papers, go to an accountant, give it to them, and then they basically prepare a tax return. I have to look at it. So I think that that is, uh, um, and Estonia actually uh, implemented this almost 15 years ago. So I think there's been a lot of stuff going on there, but uh, I would say generally. Uh, when I tell people some of the some of the interactions I have with government here, they just laugh. They just say that we solved that problem, you know, a decade and a half ago. Mm, go yeah, fifteen years. That is interesting. Yeah. Well, thanks, Doug. Um, if anyone has any further questions for Doug, please just email him directly, or I can do an introduction. Um, but thank you very much, Doug, for your time today. And I know you've managed to squeeze a lot in just a little short time frame. I know you've got a bigger brain, and there was lots more information you could depart to people. So please do contact him directly if you want to actually delve into some of those topics a little bit more. Um, thanks, Doug. And our next sessions coming up in the beginning of the month are from Scott Kabat, which is about marketing for startups. And he's doing a whole series on um, marketing for companies. So go to our website and have a look at those. Thank you all for tuning up. Kakiti.